It's worth seeing, right? But so I was at, I was um, just recently, I was at an initial home-based consultation for a student that has really dangerous self-injurious behavior. Um, it's a 10-year-old girl with autism who hits herself in the head, um, multiple topographies, right? And after a period of direct observation, I was sitting down with her parents to discuss my initial impressions of the case. Um, I, I was talking to the parents uh, about how I had noted in this student's school-based record that there was a long history of failed treatment using reinforcement-based techniques, and that there had also been several attempts to conduct functional assessments, all of which yielded ambiguous results. So I, I assured the parents that I would be replicating uh, many of these strategies, that I too would want to conduct a rigorous functional assessment, including a functional analysis, and that I would and um, be conducting multiple iterations of treatment analysis in order to try and identify a reinforcement-based strategy that could reduce their daughter's self-injury, which, just, just to, um, for the record, was causing some pretty serious bodily harm, okay? Um, now, this, this conversation was going fairly well. It was pretty casual until I, I felt the need to be upfront and transparent with these parents. And, and I, I brought up that there was this long history of failed treatment. Um, by, by the way, this particular student um, attended one of the most well-known schools for individuals with autism, um, you know, really, really top-notch. So the treatment integrity, it's likely that the treatment integrity of the, of, um, the attempts were, were pretty solid. Um, and I, I even brought up that the school had also tried some more intrusive strategies already in the way of um, contingent use of a helmet um, to, to try and reduce this, this child's self-injury. And then I said, if my treatment analyses using reinforcement-based procedures fail to identify a strategy that could be effective in reducing this behavior, I may be in a position to recommend the exploration of more intrusive procedures in the way of a punishment procedure. And at the sheer mention of the word punishment, this student's mother became very upset and even began to cry. And it, it wasn't until um, I continued to explain what I meant by punishment that she calmed down pretty quickly and actually got a really confused look on her face. She looked at her husband, who then looked at me and said, oh, we've been doing that stuff for years, right? Um, he explained to me that they um, regularly screamed at their daughter to try and get her to stop hitting herself. They regularly put her in a room alone to try and get her to stop hitting herself. They had even tried pulling their daughter's hair contingent upon head hitting. Um, and, and again, we're talking about um, really challenging behavior that was causing bodily harm, right? And it, it occurred to me then that this was uh, a perfect illustration of the current state of understanding surrounding the clinical use of punishment. You see, there, there's such hysteria and controversy surrounding punishment at this point um, that, that you can't uh, even bring it up in conversation without offending someone or causing a really intense avoidant response, right? And, and I, I want to be clear that I don't think this reaction is exclusive to parents, right? Because I, I've, I've met a lot of clinicians and even behavior analysts that have this same kind of um, response. And a lot of times it appears as though people are having this response without even being well informed about what punishment actually is. And I think there are a number of reasons for that, and I hope to explore it. So I want to I wanna continue by examining the nature of punishment. Right? So reinforcement and punishment have a certain symmetry. It's not a perfect symmetry, um, but they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And what I mean by that is reinforcement and punishment are forces that exist in our, in our natural environment. Right, without anyone planning for them, right? They exist. This, these are the, the forces um, that result in us learning different responses, okay? I think that we're more inclined to recognize the existence of, of natural contingencies of reinforcement um, because, you know, reinforcement has um, a lot more uh, uses in clinical settings. It's much less intrusive. You can use reinforcement in isolation. And what we're doing in clinical settings is actually trying to um, approximate the natural contingencies of reinforcement um, by presenting our learners with an ex uh, a contrived and explicit, explicit version of them in the hopes of, of eventually fading them out so our learners come under the control of their natural environment, right? So we, we think about natural contingencies of, of, of reinforcement a lot, but I, I don't think that we stop to recognize that 
we're, we all encounter um, countless contingencies of punishment in our environment as well. Hey, how many of you have ever turned the wrong knob in a shower and been blasted with cold water? Right? I have. That's happened. Right? Um, I was uh, less likely to engage in that response in the future. Right? Um, maybe some of you have eaten some food that was a little too spicy, were a little too adventurous. Right? Uh, I mean, it touched a hot stove. Right? I mean, these are all very simple, crude examples. There are actually very complex contingencies of both reinforcement and punishment that exist in our natural environment. So this is the common conception, right? Punishment equals bad, reinforcement equals good, right? And I, I, what I hope to demonstrate um, when I was talking in the previous slide, that this is, this is a simplistic view, right? And, and this often comes from people's um, understanding and experience of the use of punishment in clinical settings, right? But these things exist in our natural environment. Punishment and reinforcement are not inherently bad or good. Right? Can, so, so just going back to those, those first questions that I asked you, the, the initial survey, um, so I think all of you answered yes, that it's ethical um, to use positive reinforcement to influence a person's behavior. Can you think of a situation where it wouldn't be? Right? Doesn't both desirable and undesirable behavior fall under the control of positive reinforcement? Right? But yet all of you were quick to raise your hand, right? because this is the common conception. It, and it's not, it's not that you have some deficit you know, right, um, in your understanding of ABA. We just don't think about it. Right? The general trend is, is to be quiet about punishment and not, not think uh, about it deeply. Right? But punishment bad, reinforcement good is, is a really um, simplistic view. Right? And I just want to take the moment to say on, on the um, kind of the point that I'm not here advocating punishment. Punishment in clinical settings represents a highly intrusive treatment practice and should only be undertaken with caution by people who know what they're doing, right? There are a whole host of potential undesirable side effects that can result from the use of punishment in clinical settings. And those things include, and, and these are spelled out in your handout, but things like both respondent and operant aggression, right? Punishment, the, the implementation of punishment itself can model problem behavior, right? Um, the implementation of punishment can actually represent a contingent, uh, contingency of negative reinforcement for the, the person delivering the punisher, right? which can ultimately result in a higher likelihood of abuse. And one of the biggest concerns that people often report um, regarding punishment, the use of punishment in clinical settings, is its transient effects, or that it doesn't have long-lasting effects. Right? But, so on, on the idea of symmetry, right? so the emphasis when we're talking about punishment is, is almost always placed on the potential undesirable outcomes, right? But what about, what about reinforcement, right? Aren't there potential undesirable outcomes that can result from reinforcement? Do any of you uh, have learners who become so dependent on the explicit systems of reinforcement that you've put in place in your classrooms that then they can't perform that same skill or response under a natural contingency of reinforcement in the environment where, where they should be doing that behavior in the first place? I have. Right? That happens to, to me all the time. I have to try and troubleshoot that and plan for that. What about overconsumption right? resulting from reinforcement? How many of you have learners that are overweight or obese? Right? What about addiction problems, gambling? Right? And what about the transient nature of reinforcement? Right? So this is something that, that I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't have a clear understanding of this, but um, it seems like uh, a response that has been previously reinforced that ceases to encounter reinforcement is, is likely to, uh, the likelihood of that response is, is um, gradually reduced, right? That's extinction, isn't it? Right? So doesn't reinforcement also have um, that transient effect? So again, not to, not to be a proponent of one side or the other, but to encourage some critical thinking about